Hello. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. I'm Kirsty Kivna Newman, your Blue Coat host for today's Blue Coat Talk. And I'm a senior scientist at Science North and also a member of our green team. So Wednesday will be the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And in honor of that, I'd like you to stay tuned with us for the rest of the week for more Earth Day themed events. Today, I'm super happy to be here virtually with Franco Mariotti. He's a biologist, naturalist, and Science North Blue Coat Emeritus. I'm sure there's some of you out there for sure, probably more of you out there for sure that know who he is. And he's also one of my favorite people because we worked closely on Science North traveling exhibits for many years. And he's a fabulous storyteller. Today, he's gonna to be telling us the tale of Science North's journey of regreening. It's a story of hope and one that is far from finished. It's also a story that the rest of the world should be paying attention to. So, hi, Franco. Hey, Kirsty. Great to see you virtually. Yes. <laughs> how are you doing? All right. How are you? Good. I'm so glad we're doing this because it's such a great story to tell everyone. So, I'm pumped. So, you're going to tell us about regreening today, and you're going to tell us a story in pictures. Right. It, it, it's a great story, but boy, having the real photos really helps to tell this story. So that's what I love to do. Um, I want to start by, by saying, you know, people who are growing up in Sudbury now, uh, the Sudbury we see today is totally different, totally different than the Sudbury I grew up in back in the 1960s. So what's that? That's, oh gosh, that's almost 50, 60 years ago. <laughs> Hard to believe. Anyway, let, let me show you, Kirsty, let me show you what Sudbury used to look like 40, 50 years ago in the early 60s. So the next picture, Renata, look at this picture. In the background, those are the three stacks in Copper Cliff Smelter before the super stack was built. So this picture was taken in the early 60s. And believe it or not, this is not a black and white photograph. It's a color photograph, <laughs> not much vegetation, there's uh, a, a few dead bushes in the foreground, but in the background is strictly black rocks. And I wanna show you what my backyard in Coppercliff, where I grew up, looked like. Next photo. Now, it's an old photo and it's a little slightly out of focus, but if you look carefully, there's not a single blade of grass in what I would say was my backyard, strictly rocks. And of course, Sudbury back then was known as the city that looked like the moon. Totally different than today. So the truth is, I grew up in this kind of landscape, like many Siberians back then, thinking that this was totally normal. I always thought Sudbury looked like this, but that's not the case. The Sudbury of four generations and human generations earlier in the late 1800s looked totally different. Let me show you what I mean. The picture you're seeing is a steam engine, which was really what created Sudbury. Um, Sudbury was a product of a national dream. And what I mean by that is that when Canada was formed, was created in 1867, the politicians at that time wanted to join the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific. And you have to remember, there's no phones back then, there's no roads, no cars. They hadn't been created yet. But what they had were railroads, was a railroad, steam engines. And so they physically joined the Atlantic, the Pacific with these steel rails, and as the train made its way across Canada, um, it, of course, every few hours it needed water. So here in Northern Ontario, there's plenty of lakes, but right downtown where Sudbury is today, where the uh, CPR station is, there's a creek that is now called Junction Creek. The steam engine used to stop there when there was nothing there. It was a wilderness, used to take on water. And it did this so often that eventually they built a junction and a little village of prospectors and trappers grew around that junction. Let me show you what the village looked like. Well, just before I show you what the village looked like, take a look at the sum of these trees, the forest that were in this area, red and white pines. The forest that was here was primarily huge red uh, old growth pines and white pines, some of them 50 meters in height, you know, things you just don't see around Sudbury anymore. But Around that, the logging began and the village looked something like this. What you're seeing is literally what is now downtown Sudbury. 
that is clearly a church in the background called St. Anne of the Pines. And uh, the little village that grew up in and around Junction Station was called St. Anne of the Pines after that church. But in 1893, uh, a train engineer moved to Sudbury and he brought his new bride. She had come from England and she was incredibly homesick. You can imagine what this landscape must have been like versus where she came from in England. And in her honor, because she was so homesick, the engineer renamed the village of St. Anne of the Pines to Sudbury after the town where she came from in England. So this is how Sudbury began its, got its name. And in 1893, there were about a thousand people living here. And the fresh water that they drank from came from a spring in a quarry just at the edge of town. Unbelievable. Next shot. Now, everybody knows that Sudbury is mining, but really it began as logging. And mining didn't really begin until late 1800s, almost at the turn of the century. Sudbury discovered funny colored rock at the side of the railroad, which was copper and nickel, and mining began in earnest. Next one, Bernetta. Take a look at this picture. This is something very unusual. Common at the time of the late 1800s, early 1910 and 20s, but today almost nobody knows its existence. This is what you call a roast yard. And that big black speck right in the center of the photograph is actually a person standing on a pile of wood. It's got it, that person has his back to us, bending over, sorting out the pile of wood. And what you're seeing is an area that covers five football fields. That's how big this area is. And if I were to take the viewers back to the early 1900s when they used the roast yards, what you would see is two trains, steam engines coming on either side of these five football fields, not carrying ore initially from the mines, but carrying wood. Any trees that were not cut down by the loggers, so poplar, birch, maple, were all clear cut to feed the roast yards. And the reason why these roast yards existed is that the wood was used to burn the sulfur out of the minerals, out of the rocks that Sudbury, um, that the miners obtained in the early mining and the early open pits. You see, let me clarify this. The technology at the time, when they smelted, when they tried to get nickel and copper out of the rock, sulfur was an impediment and sulfur was in, in, uh, embedded in the rock. And a Swede came up with the idea that if you want to really get a pure nickel and copper, you just burn the sulfur off. So these roast yards acted like huge bonfires that burned the rock, literally. Now, it wasn't just a short few hours. So let me explain. When they dropped the wood in these roast yards, when the miners put the wood in these roast yards, they then came back the following day carrying the ore from the mines in the open pit. And that's what you see in the background in this photograph, these pyramids of uh, long uh, piles of rock that were piled on top of the wood. And if we look at the next photograph, these roast yards would be set on fire, like a huge bonfire. And this roast yard, this was the biggest in the Sudbury area. Get this, it would burn for 24 hours around the clock for as long as nine weeks. The smoke coming off these roast yards were saturated with sulfur. And as the smoke traveled across the landscape, it literally killed every bit of vegetation in its path, leaving something that looked like this. Next one, Renata. Look at that. There's the roast yard in the background smoldering. And all of the vegetation that surrounded the roast yard was killed, exposing the soil. It almost looked like, oh gosh, you know, like, like a war had been through, even worse. And of course, every time it rained, the soil would be washed into the local streams and into lakes, leaving this. Very barren landscape. And by 1928, the miners, the powers that be recognized that this can't be good for the environment, for the local landscape. Mm -hmm. So the stacks, the first of the stacks were built in 1928 in Coppercliff to replace the roast yards. And the idea was you let the smoke out high up into the atmosphere and you know that should be much better for the environment. And of course, smelting like this thrived right through to the second world war. 
we look at the next photograph. By 1943, 50 years after uh, Sudbury was founded, 50 years, there were 50,000 people living here. Almost 1,000 people a year came to Sudbury. And Sudbury was thriving because we became known as the nickel capital of the world. We supplied, during the Second World War, we being Sudbury, supplied 95% of the world's nickel, the Western world's nickel supply. An incredible amount coming from one place. So Sudbury gained the reputation around the world as nickel capital. And for those visitors who came to Sudbury during that time, we gained a different reputation. Look at this next photograph. The environment surrounding Sudbury literally looked like the moonscape. And we gained the reputation as a city that looked like the moon. So if you look at this photograph, you see old stumps. And what's really unusual about these stumps is Look, you can see the roots right down to the rocks. And when I used to hike in these, what we call the rocks uh, in our backyard with my friends, you know, once in a while we come across these trees and I would shake my head and I thought, what, what is this? You know, who brought them here? I could not understand the concept that there used to be a forest where these stumps now were. I just didn't understand. I couldn't believe it. I was told that there once was a forest, but I never experienced that. I have always known a Sudbury that a place that looked like these black rocks in the moon. And what's really neat about this picture, Kirsty, if you look carefully, especially at that stump in the center, there's a bit of a white mark about a, about a meter above the ground. Mm -hmm. That white mark is the soil line. Literally, that's where the soil used to be, up a meter above, covering those roots. So through the last eight or nine decades, every time it rained, the soil would be washed away until it totally, we totally lost the soil that used to be in and around Sudbury. About 80 square kilometers has been impacted in this manner. The other thing that's, that I find astounding with all these pictures is um, how black all the rocks are. And if you think yeah. of that smoke, I don't know, I can't imagine people being able to live anywhere near where the roast yards were. I don't think yeah. houses were not as they are today. And if there's smoke blowing for months and months and months and months, I can't imagine what that would have done to the people also. Well, it, it wasn't only back then. When I grew, was growing up in Little Italy and Coppercliff, we literally, Little Italy was situated literally beside the smelter. Mm -hmm. And back then, you can imagine that the air quality was nowhere near what it is today, literally nowhere yeah. near. And every few weeks, we would be fumigated with these clouds of sulfur. And, you know, back then, that was considered as common. And, and when I told, when I asked Louis, and I'm going to talk about Louis shortly, Louis was my next door neighbor who was a retired miner. I said, why aren't people complaining about this? And the feeling back then was, you know, well, you don't bite the hand that feeds you. People accepted that as a sign of progress. We got our, 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 our good quality lifestyle because of doing that kind of work. But let me show you this picture of the lake that we used to walk to, to in, during the summers. The next one, Renata. This is what we used to call Clarabelle Lake. So from Little Italy, I would, it, during the summers, I would walk across the rocks and we would, my friends and I would go swimming in this lake. Uh, it was totally acid dead. I mean, it's not dangerous to swim in an acid dead lake. There's just no life in it. You know, that's why if you were living in it, you couldn't live in it if you were an aquatic creature because you just, it's too acidic. But for swimming in the summer, it was a beautiful place to go swimming. It was cool. And I remember one day, and this is a true story, walking back from Clarabelle Lake, having swum in this lake, and Louis, my next door neighbor, stopped me just in front of the house. And he said, Frank, who says, where are you coming from? I said, well, I, Louis, I've just come back from swimming in Clarabelle. And this is what he told me. He said, oh, Clarabelle, he says, I remember when I was your age, I used to bring cows grazing here on the shores of Clarabelle. I said, no, no, Louis, take, and the folks, take a look at this picture. You, can, you cannot bring cows grazing here, let alone walking across the rocks, which would not be very good for them. There's nothing to graze on. I said, Louis, no, no, I'm talking about Clarabelle. There's, there's no way, you know, you can do that. He says, no, no. He says, Franco, he says, when I was your age, that used to be all farmland. And cows used to graze here. Now, I knew Louis was getting older. And I remember thinking, 
I, I don't want to disagree with him, but I thought, well, you know, maybe he's getting a little bit senile. And the funny thing is, not so funny, when as I got older and went to Laurentian University, one of the courses I took at university was uh, industrially disturbed ecosystems. And the professor at that time talked about what happened to Sudbury. And I had a sudden flashback to what Louis had told me about Clarabelle Lake. And I couldn't believe, you know, that people used to grow vegetables, graze cows in and around Sudbury. And I was growing up in a moonscape. And the question is, why aren't people, why weren't people demonstrating in the streets of what happened? And there's a very simple answer to this. And it's a very profound one that I've come to understand why people accept degradation in the environment. For me, Sudbury was always a moonscape. I knew nothing else. The only Sudbury I've ever known was the Black Rocks. And I thought that was normal. Louis, on the other hand, had grown up when he was younger in an environment that was green. So the question is, why wasn't Louis demonstrating? You know, the change over those two or three generations occurred so slowly that no one generation recognized the loss of the previous one, unless you're old enough to have experienced that. I certainly wasn't. And there's no way I could understand what an old growth red pine forest was. So let me show you what our backyards should have looked like. Imagine having this, and this will explain why people accepted the moonscape. So imagine growing up in this environment, literally in your backyard, and within one year, becoming this next picture. You can imagine if the change had occurred in such a short time, people would be demonstrating in the streets, not only Siberians, but across Canada saying, what has happened to Sudbury, right? But because that change was so slow, nobody recognized what they had lost from the previous generation. That's why I, ex I accepted the moonscape as totally normal and wasn't concerned about demonstrating old growth because I never experienced old growth forest. Next photo. In, in terms of the generations also, I, I was born when regreening was just beginning. And then my daughters are, are only about a decade old now, about 10 years old. <clears throat> and when I was little, I remember there not being many trees and stuff like that. But as I've grown throughout my life, the trees have kind of grown with me. Yes. And it, but it, it takes time to think about it. And if you're not, that's why I think this story is really important to share because if you don't understand where our environment used to be, then I'm used to like the kind of scrubby bush that we have now with, right. with, with pines and birches and all that kind of stuff. And to me, that seems normal, but if you don't understand where we were before and the history of the area, then you can't understand what used to be here. And then my girls are younger, are younger now. And last year, I remember them seeing smoke coming out of the smokestack and they were very disturbed. They were like, what is happening? There's smoke coming out of the smokestack. But if I think back to when I was a kid, there was always smoke coming out of the smokestack. That was a norm. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to tell a story from my husband, he, but he, he remembers when he was really little, thinking that the clouds used to come from the smokestack <laughs> because there was constant stuff coming from there. And I remember in school and stuff like that, being outside and you could tell when it was like a really sulfury day when the wind was blowing the right way and you could taste it. And I'm really happy to say that I've tried to explain what that is to my girls. Even there's still some days sometimes where I can kind of, but they have no concept of it and I can't explain it to them and they don't understand what that taste is. And that's a really good thing. That's a, this is a great segue, Percy, to the next photograph I wanna show you. So that moonscape that I was talking about all changed. Can we go back to one previous one, please, Renata? To this photograph. Yeah, no, no, yeah, this one right there. <laughs> the green, what looks like a green lawn. This photograph was taken in 1977 and it was the first attempt at regreening in the Sebri landscape. There was a professor at Laurentian who was an ecologist and he had wanted the red and white pine that used to be here to come back to Sudbury. But you'd have to reconstruct this ecosystem, right? And one of the dilemmas was not just the barren landscape, 
but whatever soil and dirt that was left was too acidic for natural vegetation to grow. The, I mean, the seeds would always come in from the tree line, always was blown in. But as these seeds started growing, they would die within weeks because the soil was full of heavy metals and acidity. So the challenge was that if you're going to reintroduce trees, vegetation, to this landscape, you have to deal with the acidity. You have to reduce the acidity and, and block the heavy metals. So what he discovered was that by adding limestone to this very acidic soil, the pH would rise which is a good thing, would come back to neutral. And seeds that would be blown in or planted can grow in that neutralized soil. Now that was fine in the, in the lab where he did this test for years on, on plant pots. But this photograph you are seeing is actually a schoolyard in the north end of Sudbury where he encouraged the teachers and students to actually, let's do this out in the real world. So they spread lime and planted grass seed. And within a few months, that barren landscape that you see in the background of this picture, look, you can see delineated where the limestone stopped. It became, for the first time, a green natural carpet. People were not used to seeing this. So this was the first year in 1977. In 1978, the following year, the mining industry took a downturn. And this professor went to the city of Sudbury and said, look, a thousand miners are laid off. Let's rehire them and they could begin the regreening project. So this next photograph, you're going to see these are retired miners walking across the landscape like an army. And the next picture, spreading lime by hand. This was before the era of ATVs. And all that white you see on that landscape is not snow, but limestone. Literally an army walked across the landscape spreading the lime. So what I want to do is now show you before and after pictures of the areas that have been regreened. So let's start. Next photos. This is a picture taken at the west end of Sudbury, what we call the uh, west end or Gatchel area. And take a look at that black moonscape, right? The picture is taken in 1979. And I'm gonna show you the next picture 22 years later. Look at that moonscape. It's not a moonscape, there's a young forest. What happened was that those rocks were limed Grass was planted, and the reason why they planted grass, because some of you may say, well, grass is not exactly normal. It's not, but what the purpose of the grass was to capture the seeds that, we, that would be blown in by the wind, and they had, the grass would trap those seeds, and now that the soil was neutralized, those tree seedlings would grow. Now, not only was there natural vegetation returning, but the conifers you see in that 2001 picture below, those were planted by hand. So trees came back just as fast, as we planted them. Now you can imagine what this does in growing up from a moonscape to one that is a forest in your backyard. This is a green area. So you can imagine if you had a house and wanted to move and you wanted to sell your house in what surrounded an area that looked like the moon, it went for rock bottom prices. 20 years later, you now live in a green belt and the kids growing up here would grow in the shadow of those trees and see birds and snakes in that forest. Your house now has gone up not only in quality of life, but in value. So the dramatic change occurred just within a few short decades. But let me show you some even more impressive pictures. This is a classic one that many Siberians have seen. Um, it is in the sort of the Southeast area of Sudbury. See the classic moonscape, new apartment buildings and homes down below. I wanna show you the same picture 22 years later. Now look at, take a look at that. Now these people who are young families are growing up with kids being able to walk and, and play in a green area, no longer the moonscape. There's actually updated pictures it's taken as recently as last year, but you cannot see anything because the trees are crowding not only the hills in the background, but the houses. So you'd be looking at a wall of leaves in front of you. That's how much the trees have grown. Next photo. Franco, before we go to the next one, we've got a question from Noah. Yeah. And he says, as one of those among us who cares about the natural world, and like myself, are students of the biological sciences, how do we collectively raise public consciousness around the world? This is the question. Yeah the plight of our planet to convince people that progress does not have to be at odds with living in harmony with the natural world. 
First and foremost, that's a great question. First and foremost is we need hope. How do you get, I mean, you just can't say, okay, I'm hopeful now. You need examples of hope. Yeah. The Sudbury regreening is one of the greatest restoration stories on this planet. Um, the people who are now living in Sudbury live in a much healthier environment, an environment that has a much greater biodiversity. And by using what has happened in Sudbury and how people were involved in the restoration of Sudbury, that's what people around the world need to know, that we can restore the damage we have done in many places around the world. Here in Sudbury, we have recreated a forest ecosystem. And once we've started recreating that, nature started coming back on its own. We are seeing species, everything from spiders and insects to birds that we haven't seen here in decades because of the return of the forest. And if we had not done nothing at all, it would have taken biologists feel almost 300 years before that soil would have been neutralized naturally and the trees would have come back on its own. We did this in one human generation. We are now celebrating 42 years of regreening. And most of all, not only should we continue doing it, and we are, but we need to tell the world what we are doing here in Sudbury. And that is the answer to Noah's question, foremost and primarily. And the nice thing, Kirsty, is you can now go to university and get a degree in restoration ecology, where that was unheard of when I went to university as a biologist. So, so there are great examples of what need to be done, but we need to tell people these tremendous stories that are happening, not only here in Sudbury, but around the world. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And we are working on a, a climate action show that's an update to our, our sheepy climate change yes. show series, our object theater. And I was working on the content on that. And in terms of the research, we did a, a ton of research on how to best communicate and, and talk to people about climate change and climate action and why it's important. And, and just how to speak about it. And one of the most important things is to talk about it for one thing and to talk about things that you're doing, to normalize things that you're doing that help and to talk about the stories of hope because that's the, the easiest way to, to help people to understand that, that there is hope and that we can make a difference. Absolutely. You need a reason why you should have hope. But yeah. the nice thing, you know, when you do, my wife tells me that I'm a very hopeful person and I am perhaps a little bit naive at times, but I'm a very hopeful person. And why? Because I've seen the change in Sudbury from a moonscape to what we have today. And we helped to do that. And that's what I'm going to tell you about next, how we did that. So Renata, if we could go back to that last photo. Now, I would just want to show you two more places before and after shots that I think are absolutely amazing. Take it, I mean, talk about a moonscape. This is um, near Garson. That little white speck in the center of the picture is a head frame from a mine. So I wanna take you, uh, I want you to keep an eye on that white little tiny head frame. And I wanna show you this next picture 27 years later. Look at that from what virtually was black rock to a young forest. Now, Kirsty, I'll be the first to say that if I bring somebody from Toronto and say, take a look at this forest, you know, they might laugh because you call that a forest? I agree, but look at where we've come from. Look at what we've done in one it's human generation. It's time. It, 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 it's incredible. And nature's behaving as if a forest fire has gone through and the trees are coming back. Birch and poplar totally are on their own because we've neutralized the soil. By healing the landscape, nature is behaving as if a fire has gone through because we live in a fire ecosystem. And to nature, that's just normal. So we're helping nature help itself. One more picture. And talk about a moonscape. I mean, this is mostly black rock, but there is a bit of dirt in amongst the cracks. Now keep an eye out on that radio antenna in the background and the same area 27 years later. Look at that. I, to me, it, this, this is, I just takes my breath away. So the conifers here were planted by the regreening committee known as VTAC. So people have planted those, but the birch and poplar you see in the foreground came in on their own because we neutralized the soil. And if people are wondering, 
what's happened to those heavy metals, why the heavy metals were poisoning the trees before along with the acidity. Well, it seems to be that as we neutralize the soil, for some reason, the heavy metals remain in the soil. The plants aren't taking them up as they were before. I guess the uh, low acidity was weakening the plants and the plants would also take in heavy metals. But under normal neutral soils, which are healthy, that doesn't seem to happen. So we've solved the problem of the heavy metals and the acidity. Okay, let's let's move on now to, now, I'm, we will be the first ones to say that just planting trees doesn't restore the entire forest ecosystem. This picture is taken in one of the oldest regreening sites, the Jane Goodall Trail near Coniston. And if you look at the forest floor, there's something missing. Ah, there's leaf litter, all right, but there's no hardly any uh, underbrush, no flowers, no bushes. And that's what we're beginning to realize is that a lot of these forests that we recreated is missing this understory cover. And as a result, there's very few insects, very, very little animal life that's at the bottom of the floor. So what we began doing, we, the regreening committee, known as VTAC, about 10 years ago, started bringing in mats of undergrowth from areas that were going to be destroyed by new highways. And let me show you what these mats look like. So we actually used bread baskets taken from a bakery a meter by a meter. We went out into these areas where the new highways were being built and we put the undergrowth in these bread baskets and brought them to these reforested areas that were lacking the undergrowth and started planting them. Next photo shows you a little bit more. Look at that. So these became, and we wanted them to become little patches of oases that can restore life under, in the forest. Uh, the seeds would spread from these little patches of oases and act as a nursery to restart the undergrowth. And 10 years later, we know that this is working. It's taking a while. It doesn't happen overnight. But flowers like uh, trilliums and blueberry bushes are actually spreading from these little nursery patches that we've been planting. It's going to take some time to cover all of the square kilometers we reforested, but we know that it is working. Franco, we have a question from Carly. And so we've been talking about acidity in the soil and adding the limestone to counteract that. But she's asking about the conifer trees and whether they contribute to the acidity of the soil. Yeah, so the most important thing to remember is that we are planting trees that are native to this area. So the red pine, the spruce, the white pine. And yes, when the needles fall, they do create a acidity but not to the extent that acid rain, the sulfur in that rain created, that ultimately created the moonscape, right? So the acidity we get from conifer trees does create little uh, mini habitats that are totally natural though. Other pine trees would grow, but keep in mind that the acidity used to be so strong that even conif conifer trees would not be able to grow in that moonscape until we neutralized it with the limestone. So it's a good question you asked Carly, it's just that the dimension of acidity is much smaller from the needles of the conifers. And then there's also a whole pile of people giving you a shout out and thanking you for telling the story. Oh, it's great. Mm -hmm. But we're not finished yet. We got yeah, we yeah, go no, a little back, bit more. Back to the, back, story. Back to the photo. <laughs> Here we go. So let's continue on. There's another picture of those mats. This is the subbury of today, Kirsty, and the viewers out there. Take a look at this. This is hard to believe that this was once called the moonscape. Next photo. Look at that. There are 330 lakes. Kirsty, let me repeat that. 330 lakes in the city limits of Sudbury. That is not a roundabout figure. That is an accurate to the lake figure. And by the way, when I say lake, I don't mean a pond. We are looking at lakes that are 25 hectares or bigger. That's like 60, 70 acres. That's the minimum size that we consider a lake. At one time, most of these lakes were acid dead. That meaning there wasn't any life, just like the lake I used to go swimming in. Today, of the 330 lakes, virtually all of them have fish populations that have come back on their own because of the sulfur reductions, um, 
when the provincial government started putting reductions on the amount of sulfur coming out of that stack, we know it's worked because all of these lakes come back on their own. But well, one of the most exciting things, Kirsty, mm -hmm. we know that water quality returned not just by reducing the sulfur, but by planting trees around these lakes. And, and I'm laughing because, you know, what's the, how can you make better water quality by having planting trees in, in, along the lake shores? And the answer to that is actually very simple. The trees along the lakes that were part of regreening uh, began to buffer the snow melt that would occur in the spring. Normally there'd be a huge flush of uh, acid water coming down from that snow melt. A lot of the trees would act buffer that, but not only that, most importantly, those trees provided organic matter for the lakes and that organic matter became food for the phytoplankton zooplankton, which in turn attracted invertebrates, aquatic insects that ate those zooplankton and phytoplankton, which in turn attracted fish. So we restored in many cases the aquatic life by planting trees along the shoreline, which just blows my mind. Yeah. We, nobody anticipated that before. We learned that from the regreening. I remember even around Ramsey when I was a kid swimming in Ramsey and to me lakes were nice and clear and you could yes. swim around and see down to the bottom even if you swam way out far yeah. and I swim all the time now in a whole pile of lakes around here but Ramsey always still just it I have to remind myself that when I was swimming in lakes and I could see down to the bottom and there was nothing growing that's not a good thing and that's not normal <laughs> But that's how I grew up. And yeah, I just, I constantly have to remind myself that it's better now. So with all this change that has happened, when Sudbury began to become green again, people's, when I say people, Sudburyans attitude changed about not only the way we looked at our city, but ourselves. That green revolution brought also a sense of hope and people who used to consider us a moonscape now looked at us as a very attractive place to come and live. Imagine having 330 lakes in your city limits, not only lakes that you could swim in, but you could go fishing in, most of them, not all of them now. It, it's amazing what we've been able to change. And if anybody calls us a moonscape anymore, clearly they're out of touch with what's been happening here in Sudbury. And that's why we need to tell the story. In fact, if there's any new name for Sudbury, it should be the city of lakes. I, I can't think of any other city, let alone in North America, in the world that has so many lakes, healthy living lakes and forests in its city limits. We really have become an example of not only how we can help nature, but help all life return and hopefully ultimately live sustainably. But I think I have one or two more pictures here left, Kirsty. Let's see. Who would have thought that in one human generation that Sudbury would become the largest tourist attraction in Northern Ontario? <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I laugh at that coming, growing up in the moonscape saying, hey, one day we're gonna become the biggest tourist attraction in Northern Ontario. And everybody would laugh at you, I'm sure, which they did. But I'm a little bit biased here because I'm showing Science North in the foreground, but look at the hill in behind. When Science North opened its doors in 1984, that hill was black. Mm -hmm. What you're seeing now, this picture was just taken a few years ago, but that hill now is totally green covered in the young forest. It's incredible what, what we've been able to do. And Renata, do we have one more picture? Yes. This is a good way to end off the presentation. Sudbury's the city of lakes. We should be not only proud of the way we have changed things, but we need to tell this story to the rest of the world about what has happened here but the quality of life, not only for humans, but for all life. And I, and I think this is, when, this is the example. When we look at what has happened here, I can't help but have reverence for other life forms that we've had to help out to come back to Sudbury. We're, you know, a spider is as much a part of the landscape here as we are. And I, and I think if anything that what Sudbury has to tell us, we need to start, and we have 
looking at other life forms what their needs are and started to put them at equal level. And, and, and what I guess what I mean is let's just try to understand other living things and why, how we're all connected and why it's so important. And when we begin to understand that process, we truly begin to appreciate not only what we've done here, but where we can go. I think that's a good way to end. Yeah. And I actually, there's a message coming from Guy Labine, so our CEO, and he has a challenge. He's challenging us to look at an area that reminds us of how far we've come. So take a look at an area in Sudbury yeah. and <clears throat> like take a role in that, in protecting that area and helping it grow. Absolutely. You know, it, I didn't quite say the exact details of how the regreening, why it was so successful, but almost every Siberian has planted a tree and has been part of regreening. That's why we feel so strongly about what has happened here, because everyone's had a part. And, and to stop that now, there's no way people can imagine that. We are continuing to plant minimum a quarter million trees every year. Oh, I should just mention, Kirsty, that this summer, 2020, we'll, we will be planting the 10th million tree that Siberians have been involved with. That's an incredible, impressive figure. So amazing really. these example, there are still places where if you walk back far enough from a road, you can't see the moonscape. Mm -hmm. uh, even where I am here, the edge of the city, uh, I live out in the country, there's a few bare patches. And over the last few years, I've planted over 7,000 trees to try and, and help come along. We all can do our part. And it's amazing when you yourself become a part of that, how strong attached you become to the landscape in what we call our home. There's one last, there's one question here from Sean, um, when you were talking about animals and species, yep. what's been the most of surprising animal species recovery seen over the decades in our area? Wow. I don't know, that one's a tough one because going from rock to, there's so many that- Well, th there, there's quite a few examples, so. Let me start off with is the first answer is once we neutralize the soils, a lot of native trees came back on their own. So that's yeah. by far the most common is vegetation that used to live here is now living here. Almost yeah. all of the 15 species of trees, which is awesome. As far as animals, I remember getting phone calls when I worked in the life science section, Science North, of people calling me saying, I've got this bug in my backyard, like an orb spider that hasn't, they've never seen before. And growing up here, I had never seen before, but used to be here. As the vegetation is returning, it's attracting native insects that never used to occur. As far as wildlife, big animals, we've had a kickstart in that too. Peregrine falcons have been reintroduced to Sudbury in the late um, 1980s, 1980, yeah. early 1990s. We yeah. reintroduced 75 birds, peregrine falcons to, that used to live here and now can be found nesting the young of their parents, 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 parents <laughs> that we released in that time period. And the two mining companies had a big hand in that are now, they're young after many generations are coming back nesting in Killarney, nesting in sometimes in an old refinery in Copper Cliff for several years. Yeah. Uh, the, the stack out in Coniston, they've nested there. Uh, in other places, so that they're coming back on their own. But we've also helped elk, reintroduce elk, as many people realize just south of Sudbury, because they used to occur here naturally. Trumpeter swans, which we still see in some of the lakes in Sudbury. Now they're migrating on their own all the way to Illinois in the winter and coming back on their own. So we've had to help kickstart some of the bigger wildlife species. Um, can I think of anything else? Well, you know, we see coyotes in downtown Sudbury. Yeah. Uh, I'm in the valley and we get lynx out here. Ah, like, yeah. And of course, we get black bears. Yeah. Yep. So there are a lot of examples of animals. And, you know, babe, that's be an interesting challenge. Do a little survey in your own backyard and compare it to what you're seeing now to what you used to remember as a kid and seeing, list them, especially birds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's a, I'm happy to say there's a lot we can point on. I think there's a lot more there that have returned that we're not quite aware of yet, especially as the, as the forest grows larger and larger.
-hmm. Any last questions? Uh, not a question, but there's a message from Julie Muscolic, our science director, saying thank you for sharing the story and for inspiring future generations and other places to do the same. And she says it's a great testament to awesome science communication apart and together in our current situation. <laughs> yeah. Science North will continue to be a big part of that, telling that story. As you say, Kirsty, we have a, a new exhibit up at the Dynamic Earth over this next year we're working on, on the regreening. So stay mm -hmm. tuned. Yep. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that one. All right. Well, it was awesome to chat, chat to chat with you today. And well, I hope to see you soon, probably virtually for a little while longer, but <laughs> you bet. Stay safe, everybody. Kirsty, looking yeah. forward to actually seeing you face to face sometime soon. All right. Have Ciao. a great day.